This tutorial about purpose is brought to you by one of the authors of Revising Professional Writing, now in its third edition. My students call me Dr. Kim. The publishers made this video available under a Creative Commons license. For more information, contact parlaypress.com. And remember, you can use the pause button anytime. If you see shadows or a green bar on the screen, change your playback quality settings. The view you see here includes everything you might learn about professional writing in my tutorials. That means content development, organization, style, and mechanics. Before you can understand these specific aspects of successful messages, you need to grasp some prerequisites. That's because a message can only be judged within its context. We'll build on Aristotle and think about a message like a document as one of three aspects of context represented by the rhetorical triangle. The other corners consist of the reader's or audience and the writer's purpose. This tutorial focuses on the writer and his or her purpose. In particular, I'll teach you to analyze the purposes for which professionals create messages in the workplace. This content is probably new to you. It's also foundational. I don't believe you can understand what makes a message successful without understanding purpose. We're going to think about purpose while examining some professional messages. Eventually, we'll analyze an email update written by a project manager at a construction company. The quality in the video makes it nearly impossible for you to read the email here. If you're a student using our book, your instructor can provide you with a copy, or you can download it at proserite.com. In this tutorial, I'll explain how to analyze purposes for communicating in the workplace. Here we go. A management researcher named Quinn and his colleagues developed a model describing why managers create messages. It's called the competing values model and it describes four purposes briefly informing, directing, consulting, and valuing. To help you understand the distinctions among them, let's categorize the purpose of four brief emails. All of them were written by the same person, a human resource professional. All of them have the same audience, the managers in his company with responsibility for hiring. When the HR professional writes to hiring managers in his company, our most expensive ads cost $250 per week, he's informing them. His message is static, as it does not require any response or further action, and it's transactional as it focuses mostly on tasks. Let's try another example. When the HR pro writes, if an unforeseen change occurs, keep us in the loop, he's directing his audience. His message is transactional because it focuses mostly on tasks. That makes it similar to informing. But it's dynamic because it does require further action from the audience. Note that no matter what the audience does, even if they ignore the message, we still interpret it as a response to the message. When the HR professional says, do you have any ideas, he's consulting the hiring managers. His message is dynamic, like directing, because it obviously requires audience response. But it's transformational, because it focuses more on people than on tasks. Quinn's model is called competing values because when a manager consults with an audience that conveys values that compete with those the manager conveys when informing that same audience. Consulting shows a focus on people and on action while informing shows a focus on tasks and the status quo. It may seem like consulting would always be preferable that's not the case. If you've ever had a manager who always asks questions and never provides information, you'll know that that's not an effective manager. Instead, the point of the competing values model is that managers are most effective when they communicate messages with diverse values over time with all members of the organization. So what's actually preferable is that a professional not be stuck communicating for any one or two purposes. The final quadrant of the model is devoted to situations in which the HR professional is valuing his audience. For example, when he writes thank you or makes them a promise 
Those messages convey a focus on the status quo rather than on action because the audience is not required to respond. They're also transformational and convey a focus on people. So the competing values model helps us think about all purposes for workplace messages by categorizing them into four classes, informing, directing, consulting, and valuing. It also reminds us that the most successful professionals communicate messages for all four purposes. All right, let's take a second and check your understanding of purpose by analyzing a new passage. It comes from a welcome letter to new clients of a real estate company. The question specifically asks that you identify the primary purpose of the passage's message and then explain where it falls within the four quadrants of the competing values model. The writer's primary purpose appears to be valuing. That message is static because thanking customers doesn't require any further response from them and it's transformational because it focuses on people more than on tasks. Notice that the sentence we strive to maintain the highest standards could be categorized as a promise which would make it an additional valuing part of this passage. I noted a few minutes ago that professionals are most successful when they communicate for all four purposes over time with all organizational members. This, however, is not the case for a single message or document. While most documents, especially more complex or longer ones, are likely to include more than one purpose, all successful workplace messages have one primary purpose. Let's consider this more carefully using the email I showed you at the beginning of the tutorial. Here's the situation with this email. The writer, whose name is Kevin Russell, works as a senior manager for a general contracting company. He supervises several job foremen. The audience, that's Russell's boss, is the owner of the company. His name's Jack Smith. Today, Russell learned there's a situation at one of the job sites called Agate Beach. Kelly, the job foreman at the site, left keys in a front-end loader, and last night two local kids got onto the machine and ran it into the corner of the building that the company is constructing. The kids and the job crew feel bad about what happened. They've been working night and day on their own time to repair the damage, but damage means that repairs are required and they push back the schedule three days and add a couple thousand dollars to the cost of the project. Russell's email was sent to update the owner on the work at this job site, Agate Beach. In order to determine the purpose of his email, we need to identify the bottom line message. You can think of the bottom line as what the writer must say in this situation. Don't worry about how it should be said when determining what the bottom line is. Just focus on the most important kernel of content or information Russell needs to communicate to his boss. Let's think about some possible bottom lines. One would be Agate Beach Project. Well, that tells the boss only the topic of the email. So another possibility, Agate Beach Project Progress Update. Okay, that's more descriptive, but it's still not the bottom line. It's still a topic. So here's the third possibility. Agate Beach Project is behind schedule and over budget. Now that is the complete claim or message Russell has to communicate to his boss. I'll have more to say about where that bottom line should appear within this email in the tutorial on bottom line placement and more to say on how it should be stated in the tutorials on style. Now that we're clear about the bottom line message of Russell's email, we can categorize its purpose within the competing values model. Do you think it's informing, directing, consulting, or valuing? It should be pretty easy to rule out consulting and valuing, right? The difference between informing and directing is whether some action is actually required by the audience after reading this message. So the bottom line, Agate Beach Project is behind schedule and over budget, does Russell's message require a response by the boss? No, it doesn't require one. That means the purpose of the bottom line and the email itself in this situation is informing. Before we leave this example, 
think about the final sentence of the email, which directs the boss to call Russell. The purpose of that individual sentence is directing, but even though that sentence is directing, it's not reasonable to categorize the purpose of the entire email as directing. The thing you should remember is that all successful workplace messages have one primary purpose, and it's based on their bottom line. You now have the means to categorize the four purposes for all professional messages. Being clear about your own purpose when you write in the workplace is absolutely critical, even if you decide not to state that purpose clearly for your audience. This knowledge will also help you provide feedback to other professional writers, and providing such feedback is an important task for nearly all professionals. Along with audience, purpose is one of the foundations for understanding the context of a message. You must understand that entire context, so the writer's purpose, the audience, as well as the bottom line message, before you can determine the specific qualities needed to create a successful document. What that means is I'm going to mention purpose many times in other tutorials.